Thank you, uh, Alejandro, for the uh, uh, introduction, and also Wahid, Alejandro, and the other organizers for the invitation. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how to analyze uh, in high dimensional limit the dynamics of uh, a class of stochastic optimization algorithms that, that are widely used uh, in signal and information processing. And first thing first, uh, this is joint work with my postdoc, Chuang Wang, at Harvard, and uh, collaborator, uh, Jonathan Mattingly at uh, Duke University. I will start with a, a toy example. Suppose you are given this one dimension non convex function, and uh, starting from x of naught, you want to reach uh, the global minimum. And on the right, we have the standard gradient descent. Every step, you take a, a step towards an active gradient direction. And the problem is that uh, if you start at, at the wrong attraction basin, then you're going to not be able to reach x of star. So we're going to consider a stochastic version of it. The recipe is the same. What we do is to replace the true gradient by gk, which is a noisy version, whose expectation is equal to, uh, to true gradient. Uh, to make things really concrete, let's consider uh, this dynamics or this algorithm. Uh, at every given step, we are taking a gradient descent step where the, the noisy gradient is equal to true gradient plus a zero mean uh, Gaussian. And here, n, tau over n is a step size, right? Now, the way to look at this, this algorithm is uh, that it is a one dimensional Markov process because the next estimate, x of k, only depends on the current estimate and uh, the uh, independent uh, uh, random component, right? Now, there are many ways of understanding or analyzing one-dimensional Markov processes. A very effective way is to slow down the dynamics. In this case, let n uh, go to infinity. That means we have infinitesimally small steps, in which case the discrete time process will converge to something that is continuous time uh, described by this uh, stochastic differential uh, equation. I don't assume everyone is familiar with uh, stochastic differential equations, but the idea of SDEs are very, very simple. What this equation describes is a, imagine a particle going through some random motion in this uh, potential field. And at any given time, the, the amount of movement, dx, at time t, of that particle uh, contains two components. The first component is a gradient, telling us that the particle is trying to reach the, the local minima of the energy landscape. The second component is a thermal fluctuation. There is a, a little bit of fluctuation of this particle. Right? Now, there's an equivalent way of describing uh, this process in terms of density evolution. Because at any given time, x of t, the location of that particle, is a random variable. It has a density. So if we call mu t of x the PDF of that random variable at time t, then uh, this time evolution of this PDF is governed by this uh, partial differential equation, so-called Foucault-Plan equation. Right? It only involves one spatial dimension and uh, one time dimension which we can easily solve, either numerically or analytically. Now, here is uh, 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 some simulations showing how, what information this uh, Foucault-Plan equation, the solution Foucault-Plan equation can tell us. This is the same function, and uh, we start at a random point drawn from this distribution, and we do this experiment over 1,000 independent trials. So the blue bars shows the histogram of initial points, and uh, the red curve is the, uh, the, uh, the analytical density from which we draw this initial point. We can also evolve or run this algorithm, and then we can see that uh, the, uh, this histogram uh, showing the migration of these estimates from the round basin of attraction to the global uh, uh, attraction basin. And also this uh, red curve, which is a theoretical solution with the focal plan equation, uh, gives us very accurate information about the evolution of this uh, empirical histogram, right? Okay. And of course, having this information as it allows us to uh, analyze this algorithm at very, very detailed levels. For example, we can know what is the uh, MSC, mean squared error, of uh, the estimate at any given step k. We can consider, instead of L2 loss, arbitrary loss functions, steady state loss, or the probability question. What is the probability that we are away from the global minima after running this algorithm k steps? Okay? All of these questions can be answered by looking at the solution of this focal plan equation. Again, which only involves one spatial dimension, one time dimension, we can easily solve numerically. And once we have very detailed information about the performance, we can also turn around and ask the question, how do we improve this algorithm, right? How do we design new regularizers that can make it uh, converge faster, more likely to be attracted in the global uh, basin of, uh, of convergence? Now, uh, the, the, the point of this, to, uh, this work is uh, to try to see how to answer some of these same questions in the high-dimensional setting, because the toy example is only 1D, 
Fundamentally, it's a one-dimensional Markov process. So we know how to understand these. But uh, the real algorithms that we consider are high-dimensional algorithms. Uh, they are coupled. Uh, and uh, is there a, a tractable way of analyzing uh, high-dimensional algorithm in a similar fashion? Okay? Now, in this talk, I'm going to use uh, two examples. One is a nonlinear regression or lasso. The other one is a sparse PCA as uh, running examples. It shows that in the high-dimensional limit, it's possible to analyze the limiting dynamics in similar fashions as uh, the toy example. And uh, the second part, I'm going to go over some of the key ideas underlying uh, this analysis, what makes it possible to have this uh, tractable analysis. So here is a few uh, introduction of these algorithms. The setting is, uh, uh, the first setting is very familiar to a lot of you, so-called generalized linear regression. Uh, Kasai is a vector we want to reconstruct. It's a high-dimensional vector. And AI is, is a collection of sensing vectors. What we measure is, is a scalar product between AI and Kasai through a uh, channel. So we can add noise to uh, the scalar products. And Y is, uh, is a true measurement. Now, there are a lot of uh, cases where this uh, model makes sense. For example, nonlinear sensors or imaging where uh, the measurements are Poisson random variables whose expectation is equal to the scalar product or logistic regression, all kinds of uh, cases where uh, generalized linear models make, uh, make sense. Now, how do we estimate Kasai? Uh, a common approach to solve this minimization problem where the cost function has two components. The first part is a loss function telling us uh, the mismatch between uh, the measurement and any postulated solution. And the second part is a prior. Right? Now, we're going to consider the streaming uh, setting where we don't assume all the measurements uh, arrive at the same time. Instead, they arrive in a sequential fashion. All right? And uh, uh, why do we want to consider streaming algorithm? Because uh, there are a lot of benefits of a streaming algorithm. They can do a low delay reconstruction, so-called estimation on the fly. Uh, every step, these kind of algorithms typically op operate on very small blocks of data, so they're very efficient and also memory efficient. And they can also track time-varying signals. So these are the, the benefits of uh, of a streaming algorithm. Now, as a concrete example, let's consider this setting where the loss function is a quadratic function and the regularizer is the L1 norm. So this is the, the classical lasso setting. And the algorithm that we consider is the following. We so-called online proximal gradient descent. At any given step, we assume we receive one new piece of information and we take a gradient descent step only where the gradient is computed on this particular piece of information, right? and then followed by a nonlinear RAD applied to every coordinate, and this nonlinear RAD can be, for example, the proximal operator of this uh, L1 function. But uh, in analysis, this uh, nonlinear RAD or the, uh, uh, this regularizer do not uh, need to be convex. Okay? They can be fairly general Lipschitz continuous functions. All right. Now, the, uh, the second example uh, we're going to consider is uh, so-called the sparse PCA. The setting is very uh, simple. We're given a sequence of samples drawn from a high dimensional distribution. And given these samples, we want to find uh, the leading eigenspace of the covariance matrix of the uh, joint distribution. Uh, how do we solve the PCA problem? This is the ideal formulation. If we have sigma, the, the covariance matrix, then the leading eigenvector is really solved, uh, form defined uh, in this way. Now, to actually solve this problem, we can use a so called projected gradient ascent method where every step we take a gradient ascent uh, uh, step followed by normalization. We want to make sure the norm stays the same, and this is the same equivalent to a power iteration. Method, right? okay. Now, there is only one problem with this method. Uh, this algorithm requires knowledge about the population covariance, sigma, which we never have access to. Instead, we only have access to data. So what we do is we can replace sigma by the instantaneous noisy approximation, y, y transpose. And we reach this uh, very simple uh, streaming algorithm, so-called OYAS method. This is a classical algorithm starting from 1985. Okay. Now, and uh, we can also make things more complicated by adding a nonlinearity after each gradient ascent step. And this nonlinearity can be used, for example, to promote sparsity, uh, to denoise uh, these samples, and so on. Okay. So this is the setting, uh, the type of algorithm that we want to analyze in the high dimensional limit in a very precise uh, uh, fashion. And again, we can understand this algorithm. Uh, in principle, these are conceptually very simple algorithms. These are Markov processes, because the next estimate only depends on the current estimate and some independent new piece of information. So it's a Markov process. The only challenge is that these Markov processes uh, 
uh, run in high dimensional space. So everything boils down to how to do analysis in a tractable, uh, tractable way. All right. Now here is a, a, a key message. Okay, in case I only have one minute left, and then I, I hope it's not only one minute left, Alejandro. We have. It's, <laughs> so, all right. So this is my no. In case I run out of time, this is the slide that uh, is really the most important to me. Is there some a very interesting phenomenon in the high dimensional setting, so-called asymptotic separation phenomenon? So a priori, we are studying a high dimensional joint distribution. So x of k is the estimate of the, the algorithm at step k. And p of x of k is a joint PDF. It's pretty complicated. But under certain statistical assumptions, which I'm going to talk about next, then we can show that as dimension goes to infinity, that this joint distribution will converge asymptotically to a product distribution, the product of marginal distributions. In other words, we're saying that uh, different coordinates of this vector become ID, independent identically distributed. So we can study this algorithm as if we are dealing with a one-dimensional algorithm. So this is uh, the idea. And uh, of course, this has to be made more precise because if you can see n still on the right-hand side, so there is a more precise definition of this convergence. But, uh, but intuitively speaking, we can say that uh, under certain statistical assumptions, which I will talk about later, we have this phenomenon. And this is a fundamental reason we can analyze high-dimensional algorithm in a tractable way. All right, so uh, if, I know I tell you that uh, this distribution will converge to an ID distribution with some marginal, marginal PDF pi. How do I guess it? Suppose I give you a high dimensional realization of XK. I just give you X of K, but I don't tell you pi. How do we guess it? The way to look at it is if all these entries of this vector are drawn from ID distribution from pi, then you look at the histogram, okay? You look at the histogram of this vector. This histogram should tell you what pi looks like, okay? So here is, uh, I, this is exactly what we're saying about so-called empirical measure. Uh, here is a toy example. Suppose we're given a sample, x1 to x of n, ID sample from the Gaussian distribution, and we define this quantity, so-called empirical measure, as a weighted average of these spikes. And the spikes are centered around these uh, random numbers, right? Now, there are two things that you need to uh, uh, realize about this function. The first thing is this is a probability measure because uh, it is, has a proper normalization. It's a non-negative proper normalization. Second, it is also a random probability measure because uh, uh, it depends on the, the realization, right? But uh, the thing is, uh, uh, if n is very large, then the randomness is not going to be very prominent. Here we show an example, n equal to 3,000. Any typical realization of this uh, empirical histogram is going to look a lot like uh, the Gaussian distribution. So it's not hard to imagine that if you let n go to infinity, then uh, this, you can treat, morally speaking, the empirical measure as the Gaussian PDF. Now, how do we use this convergence? And this is what we want to use next. Now here, this line uh, is a very familiar consequence of a law of large numbers. If you have a function f, then the empirical average of these ID random variable will converge to the exploitation of this f of x, right? Uh, and the exploitation is taken with respect to the Gaussian distribution. Now, we, want, we are going to use a different interpretation of this convergence. First, we rewrite the left-hand side as uh, an integration of f of x times mu. If you look at the definition mu, this is really giving us this empirical average, right? Because mu is a weighted sum of Dirac's. They pick out the xi's. Now, because mu can be understood as a probability distribution, then this formula, this integration formula, can be understood as exploitation of some random variable taken with, with respect to the measure mu. Okay? Now, it looks like we're making things more complicated, but actually, we know that as n is very large, the mu of n, like uh, something like this, will converge to the Gaussian distribution then we can pass this limit, and we can write this quantity converge to the exploitation of f x taken with respect to the Gaussian measure. Okay, this is just a, a very hand wavy version of uh, the weak convergence of uh, uh, probability distributions. All right, now how do we use it? We are going to use it in our algorithm. So here is an algorithm for the PCA, uh, and this is, uh, we don't need to worry about the dynamic, the exact form of the dynamics. It's just a, a Markov process in, on the sphere, okay? Now, at any given time, we care about two vectors. Kasai is the true underlying uh, uh, principal eigenvector. 
and x of k is the current estimate at step k. These are two n-dimensional vectors. We define a two-dimensional empirical measure uh, in this way. So at any given uh, coordinate, I have two numbers, and then I have a spike uh, in this two-dimensional plane. So in the end, we have a, a point cloud, right? Again, this dimension of this empirical measure is 2D, irrespective of the underlying m in dimension n, right? And this is also time varying because it's an algorithm, so it evolves, so it's a time varying empirical, empirical measure, right? But why do we want to study the empirical measure? Uh, for, uh, that's because a lot of the quantities people care about in, in analyzing the algorithm can be understood as function nodes of the empirical measure. For example, a, a very important measure or metric is the cosine similarity, the angle, cosine of the angle between uh, the estimate and the true vector, right? Cosine similarity measure. You can use the definition of this cosine similarity measure. It's nothing but inner product between cosine t and x of k. You write it in this way, and you can realize that it is equal to integration of cosine times x times the empirical measure, okay? And again, we can write it or understand it as exploitation of the random variable with respect to this random probability measure. Okay, that's uh, just uh, interpretation. More generally, any loss function, if you have any loss function, more general loss function, doesn't need, doesn't need to be quadratic. If, as long as it is separable, it can be written as a separable sum of uh, coordinate-wise loss functions. It can be written as expectation of this two-dimensional function with respect to this random empirical measure. Okay? Uh, it's uh, it's very, fairly general. It's not limited to quadratic. Now, the main result I want to say is that uh, uh, in the high dimensional limit, the PC algorithm that we studied, we can define this empirical measure. And because a priori, I said that uh, in the high dimensional limit, different coordinates are independent, so the empirical measure is a surrogate of the marginal distribution. They are es essentially the same, right? So we want to study the empirical measure. Now, the empirical measure in the high dimensional limit as n go to infinity will converge to something deterministic. It's no longer a random probability measure, it's going to converge to something that is deterministic, time varying, uh, which we call limiting dynamics, mu t psi of x. Okay, it's a two-dimensional probability distribution evolving over time. So this is a visualization. Now how do we get this um, uh, limiting dynamics? It turns out that uh, uh, this, this limit, mu t psi of x, can be characterized as the unique solution of a, a nonlinear partial differential equation in this way. It's not unlike the focal point equation that I showed you before. There is just a little bit difference. So at any given time, at t, uh, this uh, drift term and this uh, diffusion term also has to be time varying. So I'm, I'm just a, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about the, uh, the, the details why we have uh, this, this quantity. But in terms of visualization, you can also understand that each coordinate, coordinate is, uh, can be characterized by a uh, stochastic particle doing some random walk in the potential field. And the interesting thing about this potential field is that the drift term, which is the gradient of the potential field, is time varying. And also the, the variance of the thermal fluctuation is also time varying. The exact way they change depends on the current density. So they capture the correlation between different particles. Yeah. So probably about your piece here. Yes. Uh, Yes. Uh, here, obviously, you're no, nothing is Gaussian here, yes. So, yeah. um, a priori, there's no reason that the limit has to actually be a very fine distribution like it. Sure. It, it, it's a very good, yes, yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. So if you look at our paper, uh, the PDE is not written in this form. Uh, we don't assume a priori there is a density at all. Uh, so the PDE is written in the weak formulation, <coughs> in the measure value process. So. But uh, with uh, sufficient uh, smoothness on the initial condition, you can assume there's a density. Okay. But it's, it's, way more, it's way better to write it in the density form, you know, for interval yeah. So, yeah, this is in the limit of n, which is the... The m-dimension, dimension. yes. Dimension. Yeah. So, that, that means that you have a model that relates to different dimensions, or you don't? Oh, yeah, you have a generative model, yes. So, here is the difference between this type of analysis and a generic... It's a, it's a generative. Uh, so, for example, in the Lasso case, you assume the, the measurement yi is generated by a transpose psi going through a channel. That's the generative model. Okay. There is a fixed psi that somewhere. Yeah. This, this a transpose, but a is growing, right? 
A, A is growing, yes. How A. Is A Sorry? How is A uh, the dimension is A is, for example, you assume RID. Uh, not necessarily Gaussian, but RID or exchangeable. And, and, uh, right. so, so yeah. Is that A goes by the D. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, yes. So you yes. Oh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So uh, I don't think I have the, the form. Actually, the shrinkage is buried in this uh, gradient. The gradient uh, is a drift term. The drift term has two components. One component is a quadratic. It's a derivative of quadratic. And the other component is uh, the, the potential, which is like the L1 function. So the, it's, it's a sum of L1 and uh, a quadratic function. Okay. But also, it's time varying. It's, it, 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 it depends on the current density, so it has to change some parameters. And this is exactly captures the correlation between this one-dimensional particle and all the other particles. And otherwise, they are not really independent. They, uh, so here is a, a picture. What we are saying is every dimension is doing some one-dimensional random walk in some potential field. But in a high-dimensional setting, they all, they, although they are independent, but, uh, but the, 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 the price you have to pay is the potential field is time varying. Okay, they change over time. And the way they change over time is captured by two quantities, RT and QT, that uh, are deterministic in the high dimension limit. Okay, this is uh, uh, really what, is, uh, what I want to say. And uh, uh, how do we use the empirical uh, uh, limiting dynamics? So here, uh, if we have empirical measure, as we said, any loss function can be expressed as exploitation of this function with respect to this empirical measure. We also know that as n go to infinity, this empirical measure will converge to a limit, which we can numerically solve because it's two-dimensional uh, PD. So we can very easily numerically solve for this, uh, uh, this limit. And then what we do is to pass the limit because as n go to infinity measure converge to the uh, limit, then this uh, function nodes of uh, this measure will converge to the limit uh, modulo certain uh, technical uh, details. So we can do uh, that, that pass the limit in this way, right? So here is some simulations, you know, how do we actually use this, this, uh, this limit, knowledge of this limit. Here uh, we have a, a plot of the cosine similarity, the quality metric from zero to one as a function of time. That's a, a rescaled uh, iteration number of this algorithm. The green line and the, and the red line are what we can compute from the PD theory and uh, what uh, the blue, the, the purple dots and the blue Squares are what we get by running this algorithm over, I think in this case, 20,000 dimensional uh, case. Okay, so we can see that uh, uh, there is a concentration and if you further increase the dimension, the error bar is going to further shrink towards uh, the exploitation. Okay. Right. And uh, we can also understand uh, more refined questions about performance of this algorithm. For example, uh, in this case, what we want to do is not to recover a vector, but to recover the support of the important coordinates of this vector. And the red curve is the underlying true vector, and the, the blue one is uh, the estimate of the eigenvector. So it's very noisy. And if we want to know the support, we can set a threshold, right, and claim anything above the threshold to be important, vice versa. But the, the, the choice of the threshold will allow us to have a trade off between so called type 1 and type 2 errors or ROC curve. But how do we know the exact performance of this ROC curve? Uh, here's uh, some uh, simulations. We have, a, uh, in this case, a true positive rate versus false positive rate trade-off. That's essentially a version of ROC curve. And uh, the blue dots are uh, what we get from this algorithm, and the red line is uh, the theory at the beginning of the time. So we have, without running or without looking at the data, this is the performance you would get, and this is the performance anyone can get by flipping a coin, right? You know, it's, it's, you have no information. But then, uh, but then, if you run this algorithm, the ROC curve is going to improve, uh, and uh, this red line, the theory uh, prediction, can also accurately track uh, the evolution of this ROC curve. Uh, the benefit of this is that, uh, suppose you are a practitioner, you have a, a tolerance or a budget in terms of the, the uh, true positive rate, for the positive rate, then you know exactly how many iterations you need, how, I, I mean, uh, what, what is the amount of data you need to acquire before you reach your, uh, your Probably. Yes, question. Could you comment on the distribution that you use in the Yes, I can. I can I, 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 there's a slide, backup slide, you know, with more detail, the technical details, yeah. 
right? Yes. Yes, it's a it's a discrete ICD. So you know, for all you know, if there is no L1, for example, this uh, function, the PDE can be solved analytically. Okay, but with an L1, then you know, even the standard Fokker plan equation, you don't have a, a analytical solution. But fortunately, it's a tractable. It's a one dimen two dimensional, two spatial dimension, one, yeah, one time dimension. So it's tractable. All right. So and, and also this analysis can also be used to understand uh, the phase transition behavior. So here is a uh, a plot of uh, the typical result you would get by running this uh, PC, sparse PC algorithm until convergence, and there is a phase transition behavior. The horizontal axis is uh, the signal to noise ratio, and the vertical axis is the converged, uh, the cosine similarity. You can see that if SNI is not high enough, then the cosine similarity is going to give you zero. That means the result is uncorrelated with the true vector, right? That means the algorithm is no better than random guess. Once you cross a threshold, you have a very rapid improvement of performance. How do we understand this? You can also do it through the PDE because this also, the PDE describes not only the steady state, the, the entire dynamics of this algorithm. So we set uh, the left-hand side to zero because in convergence, uh, there will be no ch further change over time of the density. And we reach a simpler PDE which we can solve but there is still a fixed point equation you need to solve. Depending on the SNR level, there are different fixed points, and then you, you will reach different uh, phases, and uh, this is the origin of the phase, phase transition. I'm not going to do the, to the details, and this analysis is not limited to, to uh, PCA. For example, another example is online uh, gradient descent or online lasso, and uh, there's a, similarly, you can write out a, a scaling limit, and the scaling limit can be written uh, in terms of a different partial differential equation of a very similar flavor. And here, uh, for Walthall's question, uh, this is th really the, the L1. So if you think about phi as L1, then this is uh, the L5 prime, that's a sine function. But you can make it more general, at, uh, arbitrary nonlinear non-convex potential, and then it's derivative. No, it's, uh, okay, so here, Yes, it's a, technical, it's a technical question. The zero, that point, uh, because the probability of the welding at that point is zero. So we don't need to worry about that, that question. Yeah. But proving it is very difficult. Uh, and then some simulation about you know, the prediction of the theory P, uh, density versus the actual empirical histogram for uh, this lasso algorithm at a different running time, t equal to zero to t equal to 10. So uh, you can see that uh, it's a pretty accurate prediction. And uh, for a lot of practitioners, MSC is the most important metric. And then uh, from this uh, analysis, we can know the MSC as a function of uh, iteration step, rescaled iteration step, yeah. uh, theory versus simulation, right? So I think, uh, how, how much time do I have left? Maybe. Sorry? 10 minutes. Ten minutes, okay. All right, so I'm going to, I think, uh, spend more, a little bit more time on the idea because uh, the to me, the, the underlying idea is more general than these uh, particular algorithms. Why is it possible to uh, analyze these high dimensional coupled dynamics in a tractable way? Uh, here is an abstraction. The type of algorithm that we study is nothing but a recursion from x of k minus one to x of k. Well, x of k is our n-dimensional vector where n is presumably very large, finite but large. And uh, at any given step, we also have some independent randomness injected into the system, right? For example, a new piece of information, new measurement, new vector sample from the distribution and so on. Right? Now, this is a Markov process in Rn. Uh, the simple case, as we said before, is a case when different coordinates are independent. Then this is equivalent to one-dimensional problems. These are tractable. The challenge is how do we do a couple dynamics? So it turns out that the next best thing to ID is a concept called exchangeability. That's a, a very nice concept about high dimensional distributions. Okay? Not every high dimension probability distribution is exchangeable, but a lot of these distributions are indeed exchangeable distributions. So what is the definition of an exchangeable distribution? Suppose I have three random variables and P is a joint distribution. We call this an exchangeable distribution if no matter how you permit it, the three variables, the joint probabilities are the same, 
right, this is exchangeable distribution. And more generally, if you have n ver variables, then you have uh, uh, the definition of uh, finite exchangeability. You permutate, you apply any permutation pi, the probability uh, uh, stays the same, right? Okay, that's uh, uh, the definition of exchangeability. What are the examples of exchangeable distribution? The simplest example uh, is an RID distribution. Suppose all the coordinates are independent, identically distributed, it's a product, so no matter how you change the variables, they are the same, right? it's a product. But uh, the point I want to make is exchangeable distributions form a much richer family than RID distributions. So here is a, a classical example from Percy Diaconis' eight, uh, uh, early 80s paper. Uh, here's a simple example where if you only have uh, two random variables, x1 and x2, right, and each one is binary, so you only have a total of four possibilities in a sample space. So you just need to have four numbers, P1 to P4, to specify uh, this joint distribution, satisfying uh, under, uh, subject to this constraint. And everything is non-negative, they add up to one. So geometrically, uh, any possible probability distribution of these two random variables is a point within this three-dimensional tetrahedron. Every, every vertex is a, an extreme way of uh, assigning the probability mass, right? But any complex combination is a valid probability distribution. Now, what about exchangeable ones? The exchangeability says that if I interchange x1, x2, the value of the probability shouldn't change. So p1, I don't need to care about. It's already 0 and 0. Similarly for p4. What I need to enforce is p2 equal to p3, because that's a 0 to 1, 1 to 0. Geometrically, what are the distributions satisfying p2 equal to p3? It turns out that the, the, uh, all the distributions that live on this two-dimensional plane, right? You know, you have a triangular, triangular slice of this, uh, of this uh, uh, 3D tetrahedron. Now, what about ID distributions? ID distributions can be characterized by a single, a single scalar, P, right? It's ID. They form a one-dimensional curve. So we can see that even in this very low-dimensional case, uh, the dimensions of exchangeable distributions and ID distributions are different, right? So we can see exchangeable distribution form a, a very rich family of uh, a much richer family than uh, the ID family. So, and also in terms of algorithms, there's a, a concept about uh, uh, propagation of exchangeability or preserve preservance of uh, exchangeability. Uh, what we mean by that is, suppose we have an algorithm uh, here, f x of k is equal to f of k or from the previous estimate to the next one. We need to check two conditions. One condition is that uh, any permutation uh, here Will have, if you have apply any pi to the previous estimate and any permutation to the randomness, it is equivalent to permutating the original uh, result. The second condition is the randomness vector is an exchangeable random vector. Okay. I think th the best thing is to look at is to look at the concrete example. For example, this uh, uh, online lasso or online proximal gradient descent. You can easily verify the first condition is satisfied. And the second condition here, in this case, the theta case, the randomness are nothing but the sensing vector AK, okay? Suppose you assume the sensing matrices are random, okay? This is the statistical assumption that we have to assume. You, it, you, you cannot have exchangeability if you give me the CT matrix, okay? It's not exchangeable because they are fixed. But if the sensing matrix is drawn from, uh, for example, an ID family or more generally exchangeable family, then this is an exchangeable dynamics. And there are a few consequences of exchangeable dynamics. First of all, if the algorithm satisfies the condition, then we can see that uh, at any iteration k, the joint PDF of the current high dimension estimate is exchangeable. So they preserve exchangeability, okay? Sometimes people call it propagation of chaos. And uh, second, the empirical measure, mu k, these themselves form a Markov process but in a measure, in the space of measure value, um, in the space of measure, so it's measure value Markov process. So what we can do is to st study the scaling limit of this uh, Markov process. The, the, the last consequence is that uh, we have this so-called asymptotic separation rule. If the, if the empirical measure converges and if it's exchangeable, then different coordinates are asymptotically independent. And this is a fundamental reason that uh, uh, the analysis can be made, all right? So I think I, want to uh, 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 wrap up, I will be happy to talk to you about uh, other, uh, some of the ongoing work. Uh, I want to summarize this talk uh, 
In this talk, I presented our work on analyzing the dynamics of uh, stochastic optimization algorithms uh, in the high dimensional limit. So there are some technical assumptions, uh, technical uh, statistical properties that we have to use. For example, the most important quantity uh, property is exchangeability. And uh, steady state analysis of this can also be used to understand phase transitions. The last thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, this is a fairly general framework. As you can see, it's not limited to online lasso or PCA. So we have recently uh, uh, done some work about analyzing ICA and subspace learning. But we can see there's no reason why this cannot be applied to matrix or tensor factorization or all kinds of uh, algorithms that you are, you in, you're interested about as long as you can have, you can find uh, exchangeability, okay? So, and uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, so uh, typically, I think uh, if you try n equal to in the range of 2,000, you're already good, get very good uh, uh, approximation. If you want to show beautiful figures, then you try 20K. Then you have very good. But we do not have yet a finite sample analysis. Uh, it's because finite sample analysis, then you have to worry all about all the constants and so on. The proof is already, the proof is already fairly technical if, if for this asymptotic analysis because the notion of convergence is convergence of probability, random probability measures so is already pretty technical. Yeah. But I think it's doable to find some analysis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. Yes. SDE, yes. basically for Gaussian processes, we know that if you, if you really use the actual density, mm -hmm. uh, not the empirical one, you can show that the second order uh, fraction of equations, like the second order Langevin type of stuff, mm -hmm. covers faster. Uh, but uh, I think there is no, nothing known about the empirical measures. So I didn't know about the, if you use a, what is the true, what do you mean by using the true density? So if you have access to the true density. Exactly. So okay. <laughs> Yeah. So then you can talk about how fast that converges to the sure. stationary. Yeah. And but that's uh, you have to use a wasser sun distance and so on. So yeah. Uh, yes. Or you could use some spectral type of. Okay. Yeah. I understand. So yeah. in some simple yeah. cases, you can show that that's actually faster convergence. Okay. But uh, I think it's not known whether empirical distributions. But if you if you allow to work in the asymptotic limit, then the empirical is the same as uh, the true density. They okay. convert. They are the same. Okay. Then so. I have Very interesting. I'd be happy to talk. Yeah, I think I'm very curious about the current uh, work about this. Yes. So there was a question about uh, the technical details. So I think I hide a little bit technical, you know, assumptions. For example, you know, the PCA problem, we use as the so-called spike covariance model as a generative model, and uh, here uh, the AKs are independent random ve uh, vectors, and to prove, you know, say bounded eighth moment, the independent. And uh, they do not need to be Gaussian, for example, because the, the sense of convergence is weak, so it, they don't need to be Gaussian. And the underlying vector does not need to be random. It, it's just an arbitrary sequence of vectors with converging empirical measure, so they don't need to be random. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so here, uh, uh, I think, if, if we look at this example, right, uh, this example, you can imagine, because you add noise, right, and uh, if the noise is scaled properly, then any shallow uh, barrier, energy barrier, is not going to be co uh, cost you too much. I mean, after a while, you're going to cross that barrier, right? 
but but the thing is uh, uh, the amount in the so-called escape time is highly sensitive to the choice of the parameter so uh, tau right so here is uh, one uh, some sim some simulation result you just what you run this algorithm and the four different curves correspond to different noise uh, values the, the larger the sigma the noisier it is the more likely for you to jump okay but the price you pay is you have to you have to settle for a higher steady state error because you have more noise right okay but you can see that the yellow curve uh, reduces MSC from 2 down to 0 0.5 in uh, uh, running time of order 100, right? And the yellow curve, I don't know if you can see it, correspond to choosing sigma equal to 0 0.9. The blue one, you just change sigma from 0 0.9 to 0 0.6, okay? The running time shown in log scale is increased by more than two orders of magnitude. So it's very, very sensitive <coughs> to, to this is kind of a, so, I want, what I want to say is uh, having this um, uh, detailed analysis can potentially be used to tune uh, as a tuning tool, right, to select the optimal uh, parameters, well, not necessarily the, st uh, the sigma, but more complicated parameters of your, of your algorithm. Yeah. Yes? So, uh, you mentioned that the sample is sampling method and yep. then there's a continuous time yep. distribution that what if you do stochastic coordinate updates? Because mm -hmm. you know, empirically, the updating components of the variable or parameters yeah. stochastically you know, have to give yeah. a different kind of solution. Yes, um, it's, it's actually very interesting. I think in principle it can be analyzed because stochastic uh, coordinate analyzes, you know, you can think about Gibbs sampling. Mm -hmm. Gibbs sampling is every time you flip one, you know, you randomly choose one coordinate and flip it. Uh, yeah, there is so a similar, similar scaling limit of Gibbs sampling. I think it would be very interesting to see to write out what is the limit for the coordinate-wise uh, uh, descent, right? And, and compare analytically, you know, what is the difference between this and also the row action method. This is essentially row action, row action method, yeah. Yes? Maybe this is a stupid question, but uh, looking, looking at this plot, there seems to be like an analogy uh, with the choice of sigma and like the choice of the algorithm step size and stochastic gradient descent, for example, you have a larger step size gives you faster yeah. learning to yes. a higher variance yes. neighborhood. Yes. And you're observing like similar yeah. behavior with the larger sigma. So is there some, what is the relationship between these? <coughs> so here, here you can see that uh, the sigma is really uh, in the, uh, sigma is the, the, the variance of noise. Another key parameter is, uh, is tau. That's uh, the, uh, the step size. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. So in a sense, you can uh, write out the, the Foucault-Plan equation and uh, and really analytically solve, uh, look at uh, the convergence in density in the versus time uh, metric. You can numerically, you know, say what is the convergence speed. That, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. The the true. Uh, you mean the, um, depend on what you mean by stochastic gradient descent. Yeah, you mean, just say every time you run and pick one. You, you, introduce, a, you introduce a variance, and that yes. variance depends on where you are. So the previous variance and that variance are. Uh, I, I think, no, I think the. Uh, I have to look, I, I, first of all, this is a, a toy example. The, the algorithm is really what, we don't assume Gaussianity, just say uh, we, we're given this PC algorithm and then we analyze it. But for this toy example, I think uh, you can weaken it to have uh, independent omega k uh, with fixed variance, okay? Or if you have time varying variance and the variance, you know, if it depends on the, uh, the uh, current estimate, I think that should be also fine, as long as you are independent. I think the independence is the most important thing. Yeah. If you have correlation, it's a different story. Then it's more complicated. 
although the, as, you know, the asymptotic separation rule still works, but uh, writing out the, the PDE is very complicated. Yeah,